We're honored to welcome back a three-time Bicknell uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Gerald Pro Prokopovich. I almost got that wrong again. Uh, I would be remiss if I did not ask his mother, Olga, uh, who's been a volunteer for the Society for over 20 years to stand and be acknowledged. Olga, stand up for just a second, please. <laughs> Did Lincoln own slaves? The answer to the question is uh, no, he did not. 
Uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, there will be refreshments in the lobby. <laughs> Well, actually, there, there's a little more, somewhat more to the talk. Um, the subject of the talk is, in fact, questions uh, about Abraham Lincoln, uh, the kinds of questions people have asked about him over the decades, including the question, did Lincoln own slaves, which we'll, we'll touch on, and especially your questions about Abraham Lincoln. So uh, the talk, uh, like Lincoln's Gettysburg, more like Lincoln's Gettysburg Address in length than like Edward Everett's uh, two-and-a-half-hour speech that preceded the Gettysburg Address, uh, I will keep my part uh, relatively short and then ask you for your questions, and that's what we'll uh, spend some time with this evening. So be thinking, if you have questions, things you've wondered about Lincoln, things that come to mind as we talk tonight, uh, we'll spend some time doing that. Uh, I do, as I uh, said earlier, want to thank both the Historical Society for uh, having me here tonight. I do want to uh, also especially thank uh, Ms. Steimer of Gross Point North, who is responsible for about two thirds of the crowd this evening. <laughs> I saw in the uh, Gross Point Times uh, the article about this uh, event did describe me as, as being a graduate of Gross Point South. They will be hearing from my lawyer. <laughs> well, I want to start uh, this evening talking about Lincoln with a, a question uh, of my own, and then I'll be discussing some questions people have asked. But this was something that occurred to me while watching uh, the ceremonies on February 12th, the 200th anniversary of Lincoln's birthday. There were ceremonies held in uh, various places around the country. Uh, one of them was, of course, in the nation's capital, in the Capitol building, and the President of the United States was there, the Supreme Court, uh, uh, the Congress, everyone in the, uh, the government was there. And as I watched, especially as I watched the President speaking, I was reminded of something written by Chief Justice Roger Taney in 1857. <coughs> You who are history students will recognize uh, his name as the author of the infamous Dred Scott decision uh, of that year, in which the Supreme Court rejected the idea that Dred Scott, uh, as a, a, a one-time slave, could ever be a citizen of the United States because he was of African descent. Uh, indeed, according to the Chief Justice uh, Taney, no person of African descent had any rights that any white person was bound to respect. In the opinion, in the Dred Scott case, uh, the Chief Justice wrote the following, uh, explaining why uh, black people could not be citizens of the state. If they were, he said, and I quote, it would give to persons of the Negro race who are recognized as citizens in any one state of the Union the right to enter every other state whenever they please, singly or in companies, without pass or passport, and without obstruction, to sojourn there as long as they please, to go where they please at every hour of the day or night without molestation, unless they committed some violation of law. It would give them full liberty of speech in public and in private on all subjects. And it would allow them to hold public meetings on political affairs and to keep and carry arms wherever they went. So my question is, what if we could bring Roger Tawney's ghost back into this room for half an hour and let him know not only could members, of, as he described it, the Negro race come and go as they please in 21st century America, but let him know that his successor in the 21st century would have the honor of administering the presidential oath to a member of that same despised race. So my question is, what would you give to see the look on his face? <laughs> now that question is a rhetorical question. It's a question that doesn't require an answer. And many questions about Abraham Lincoln are asked in that fashion. They are statements, they are uh, political uh, diatribes sometimes. Uh, they are many things other than simple questions. In the nine years that I've worked at the Lincoln Museum, I heard all kinds of questions about Abraham Lincoln. Some of them were in the uh, political statements disguised as questions. Some were very simple questions that could be answered easily. Did Abraham Lincoln have a middle name? Answer, no, no middle name. Uh, some were apparently trivial questions. Did Abraham Lincoln have pets? Uh, yes, he did. He had a, a dog named Fido. When they went to uh, Washington, he left the dog in, uh, behind in Springfield, Illinois. But they got more pets when they were in Washington. Uh, one day Lincoln was, we, we know they had a cat at least, because one day Lincoln was eating lunch and uh, feeding the cat with uh, the White House silverware and, and 
Mary Lincoln objected to that. And uh, Abraham looked at her and said, if the fork was good enough for Buchanan, it was good enough for Tabby. <laughs> so we know they had pets. The questions, though, that people asked in these nine years that I heard people coming in every day to learn more about Abraham Lincoln struck me as interesting in that they were not often the same questions as those found in the books written by historians that were in the museum's library. Why is it that historians, professional historians, don't often address the same questions that the general public is interested in? <coughs> this question first occurred to me in graduate school. I was sharing a, a tiny office in the basement of Robinson Hall uh, with a colleague, Tom Segru, who is uh, also from the Detroit area and has gone on to a very distinguished career. I saw him the other day, in fact, on, uh, on C-SPAN doing a book talk. And I was really shocked how much he had ate. Of course, I have not changed at all. Um, <laughs> Well, Tom and I were sharing this, this uh, small office, and I had put on the wall a quote, uh, kind of a calendar from Leo Tolstoy, or attributed to him, which Tolstoy wrote, historians are like deaf people who go on answering questions no one has asked them. And one day Tom looked at that and said, well, maybe that's because people aren't asking the right questions. And that stuck with me. Who has the power, the right, the ability to decide what are the right questions? If people are asking questions, can historians afford to ignore them just because they're not the right questions? How do we decide this? Abraham Lincoln spoke to this indirectly once when uh, in a matter of an issue regarding public opinion came up. And Lincoln said, a universal feeling, whether well or ill-founded, cannot be safely disregarded. So professional historians may think that questions about Lincoln's pets or his middle name uh, or other things that they may seem to them trivial can be safely disregarded. But I would argue that that's not the case. If professional historians, uh, those trained in universities, do not step up and answer the questions that the general public wants to have answered, then those questions will get answered. History will get taught to people by Mel Gibson, by Oliver Stone, uh, and not by people who actually know anything about history. So what kind of questions do people ask about your own let me give an example of how these questions tell us both about Lincoln and about the people who asked them. The question that comes up fairly regularly in talks like this is, did Lincoln have some kind of disease? Didn't he have some sort of genetic uh, issue that caused him to be extremely tall and then perhaps he would have died anyway if he hadn't, even if he hadn't been assassinated? That question comes up regularly, but it was never asked before 1986. In 1986, an Olympic volleyball player, an American Olympic volleyball player, a woman named uh, Flo Hyman, died suddenly uh, in the prime of her uh, youth uh, from what turned out to be a genetic condition called Marfan syndrome. And suddenly the public heard of this, and now people knew what Marfan syndrome was. They talked about it, it was in the news. And uh, Hyman was tall, as volleyball players tend to be, and people put two and two together and began asking, well, what about Abraham Lincoln? He was tall. Did he have the same ailment? Well, it's hard to know, of course. It's difficult to diagnose people who died uh, over 150 years ago, or almost 150 years ago, rather. Uh, but there is technology that could give us the answer. Lincoln's DNA could be tested. There are fragments uh, that contain Lincoln's DNA, uh, things like pieces of, of tiny pieces of bone that were in the doctor's bag at Ford's Theater the night he was assassinated from the doctor who, who treated him uh, that are now in the National Museum of Health and Medicine. Conceivably, we could find out an answer to a question like that. Well, the question has been around since 1986, but the answer is not, for several reasons. Uh, the most important of which is that there's a question whether we need to know this at all. To what extent would it change our knowledge, our information, our concept of the Lincoln to know that he had this illness uh, or condition that did not affect him in any way, uh, that had no impact on what he wrote or thought, and that he was certainly unaware of? Secondly, there is the issue of performing the test itself. To do this would destroy the uh, biological matter in question and would leave it unavailable to future generations to test. 
a panel of scientists was convened in the early 90s, in uh, 1995, to review this question. And they decided, partly because there was no non-invasive test possible, not to perform the test on Lincoln's uh, bone to, to see what his DNA contained. It was conceivable that that could change uh, in the future if another test were invented. But still, the question would remain, do we need to know? Before 1986, people didn't ask the question because they didn't know what Markhan syndrome was. But they also didn't ask it because there was a sense that public figures retained some zone of privacy. It was not necessary to know everything possible about every public figure, as aliens that concept is in today. Some in this audience may remember back to 1987 uh, when a, uh, a senator named Gary Hart decided to run for the presidency. And he challenged the press to investigate his private life and see if they could find out anything suspicious, if there was any monkey business going on, uh, if there was anything uh, to be found. It took the press approximately 24 hours to uncover the fact that he was fooling around with someone who was not his wife. Pictures surfaced and were published of him with this young woman sitting on his lap uh, while sailing on a yacht appropriately named Monkey Business. <laughs> Since that time, political figures have been forced to live in a bubble where they must expect every personal activity will be investigated, will be exposed to the public. But that's not the world that Abraham Lincoln lived in. Indeed, it's not the world uh, many previous presidents lived in. President Kennedy's health problems and extramarital uh, affairs were not discussed by the press even though they knew about them. President Franklin Roosevelt's inability to walk was not known to most of the American public. It was never publicized, never photographed, never talked about, even though, of course, the photographers and uh, newspaper men following him around knew of it. <coughs> President Woodrow Wilson's stroke that led to his wife Edith becoming the first female president of the United States and governing the country for 18 months while Wilson was incapacitated and papers brought to the White House were signed by uh, uh, Mrs. Wilson brought to, to the president only in her orders. Uh, the public didn't know that. So we live in a different world today than that of Abraham Lincoln. And it's a valid question to ask whether our morals and values in terms of public figures should be transported back into the past and applied to Lincoln. In 1990, my predecessor at the Lincoln Museum, Mark D. Neely Jr., wrote an editorial called Rattling Lincoln's Bones, in which he argued that uh, while one may leave papers in an archive and with the expectation that future generations will study them, when one's bones are laid to rest, the expectation is that we will leave them in peace and that there is no valid historical reason other than simple curiosity or even voyeurism to want to know about Lincoln and his genetic condition. Well, if some questions like that one are questions that we ask today but we never have thought of asking before, in this case, on or 1987. There are other questions that go the other way, questions that we no longer ask at all, but were once of great consuming interest to people who cared about Abraham Lincoln. For example, a question that came up occasionally at the museum is people would ask, uh, was Lincoln illegitimate? That is, were his parents married when he was born? Or was he born out of home? The answer to that is a simple uh, question. His parents were married. They were married in 1806. Uh, Lincoln's older sister, Sarah, was born in 1807, and he was not born until 1809. So there was no biological possibility that uh, he was conceived uh, before the marriage of his parents. But when people ask that question, they're misremembering something they heard somewhere along the line. What they're really asking is, what about Lincoln's mother? Was Lincoln's mother illegitimate? Were Lincoln's grandparents married when Lincoln's mother was conceived? This is a question that has been around since Lincoln's time. Abraham Lincoln himself thought the answer was yes. He thought that his mother had been taken advantage of by a wandering Virginia aristocrat uh, and impregnated, uh, and that he, the person uh, uh, supposedly, uh, his, his grandmother was uh, the Sorry, his grandmother, maternal grandmother, was at the time a poor, incredulous girl, taken advantage of, and 
his so-called grandfatherness was not really his grandfather. Well, this question is not asked anymore. No one cares. But it cared, it mattered to a lot of people in the 1920s. The first director of Fort Wayne's Lincoln Museum, Lewis Warren, was a powerful advocate for Nancy Lincoln, Nancy, or Nancy uh, uh, Hanks, rather, the mother of Nancy Hanks Lincoln, and insisted that she was pure as the driven snow and that there was no, uh, uh, nothing to suspect in her background. On the other hand, most Lincoln scholars of the day, led by uh, William Martin, argued that uh, Abraham Lincoln was right. His mother was, in fact, the legitimate. They argued partly from the, the belief that a great man like Abraham Lincoln could not possibly be descended from poor white trash like Nancy Hanks, uh, and that there must have been some aristocrat who wandered by to contribute his DNA to the Lincoln family tree. Well, today such a debate couldn't happen. Single parenting is no longer a particularly meaningful social issue for many people. Um, society no longer condemns uh, unwed mothers, at least until you get to eight children and then things change. Um, if in our, uh, in our world we, we could decisively prove that Lincoln's mother was illegitimate, it would make no difference. No one would care. It would not change our views of Abraham and Lincoln. So this question tells us much more about the people who asked it, who asked it, past, I should say, than it does about Lincoln or his times. In the 1920s, this was a question considered to be of great importance. It was a different era. It was a time when older people were extremely concerned about single parenting and the increase in premarital pregnancies, uh, worried about uh, young people engaging in relations before they were married. And they had good reason to worry because the automobile had just been invented and the days of courting in the front parlor with parents in the next room, possibly armed with a shotgun, uh, were over, and now children could go farther from the home uh, to engage in, in courtship rituals. <coughs> Lewis Warren no doubt saw this change in mores as a threat to the world he had grown up in, and the assault on Lincoln's mother's reputation as simply one more step in the decline of Western civilization. But those who argued the other side of the 1920s, the Bartonites, who said, oh no, of course, uh, she was, in fact, illegitimate. They were also products of their times. The 1920s were the era when eugenics became a briefly respectable uh, scientific concept. The idea that just as cattle or corn or other uh, crops or animals can be improved by breeding, why could not human beings be improved by selective reproduction? A number of states passed laws to sterilize people they deemed undesirable. The idea that destiny was controlled by uh, blood, we would call it DNA today, that, that who your parents were determined who you would be, was strongly felt by many people. And the idea that Lincoln could have risen to the heights he reached without having a noble ancestor was simply unacceptable. Well, it was an era when to have a single African American in one's family tree, one eighth or even one sixteenth of African uh, descent, caused one to be regarded legally as black and subject to Jim Crow segregation, either <coughs> in the South or by custom in the North. Uh, it is an era different from the one we live in today. But this question, this uh, mention of Jim Crow, brings us back to the central question of the evening Did Lincoln own slaves? The question on its face, uh, I answered in a single sentence, no, and I'll repeat that, no, Lincoln did not own slaves. It's a question easily answered for anyone who knows much about Lincoln. He was born, it's true, in a slave state in Kentucky, but he was seven years old when his family left, and they moved to Indiana, a free territory, and soon became a free state. As a young man, he moved from Indiana to Illinois, a free state, and then he moved to Washington, D.C., where he became president of the United States. At no time in his life did he have an opportunity to own a slave. At no time did he have a motive to own a slave. He was a lawyer, not a planter, he did not need slaves. He never said anything good in the entire eight volumes of the Lincoln works uh, available uh, both in print and online. You cannot find a single positive word about slavery Lincoln ever uttered. He had no motive, no opportunity, no reason ever to own a slave. 
So if it's so clear that Lincoln didn't own slaves, why does the question keep getting asked? I heard it not often, but occasionally, regularly, a sort of undertone when I went to the Lincoln Museum. In Tony Horowitz's uh, wonderful book, Confederates in the Attic, he uh, visited a high school class in Alabama where the students insist that Lincoln must have owned slaves. I had my students at East Carolina University occasionally ask the question. I've had people in the audiences ask. So why does the question keep coming back? No matter how many times you hit it over the head with facts, stab it, bury it, push it under the surface of the lake, it keeps coming back like Freddy or Jason or any other killer from a slasher movie that cannot be killed. Why does the movie have so many, why does the, the, the question have so many lives of the movie villain? Well, that's really the question about did they handle slaves? Why do people persist in thinking it, that it's a valid question? One reason, to give credit to those who ask it, is simple logic. Did George Washington, the father of our country, own slaves? Yes. Did Thomas Jefferson, the man who wrote All Men Are Created Equal, own slaves? Yes, he owned it, and then some. Uh, then what about Abraham Lincoln, who wrote the Emancipation Proclamation? Didn't he own slaves? Well, the answer is no, but you can see where it comes from. In an age of iconoclasm, when we challenge and question all our greatest heroes, it's not unreasonable that some people want to challenge Lincoln in the same way, even though it's not true. More important, the question highlights a fact about Lincoln that is worth considering. Lincoln was, uh, it is today considered uh, by, by those who attack the traditional way of teaching American history, Lincoln is considered part of the dead white males of American history. Well, Lincoln was, at one time, a living white male. And as an adult white male, he had more privileges and rights than other people in his society. He didn't own slaves, but he benefited from the existence of slavery. Just as you and I don't actually employ any uh, Indonesian children at slave wages to make clothing or sneakers for us. But if we buy those products, uh, we can't help but take advantage of the low price of results. Uh, we could offer more money, I suppose, at the Walmart, but the, who would get it? It would be foolish. We can't avoid living in a world where there are grotesque inequalities and where sometimes those inequalities benefit us. Lincoln, similarly, lived at the apex of privilege in his society as a adult white man and he could not avoid being who he was. Consider, even in Lincoln's own household, he was the most free person. He had more rights than Mary Lincoln, let's say. Mary Lincoln could not vote. Mary Lincoln could not own property in her own name. Mary Lincoln, as a woman, was not as free as Abraham Lincoln. And there were people in the Lincoln household not as free as Mary. There were the boys, Robert, that he got very young, uh, Willie and Tad. They had fewer rights. They couldn't even go across the street by themselves without a parent holding their hand when they were little, because children don't have the right to do that. It would be uh, foolish, it would be insane to, for parents not to uh, subject their small children to complete supervision ordering on captivity. Uh, that's how we raise children. So there's Abraham Lincoln at the top, then there's Mary, then there are the children. And then below that, in some ways, were its servants. The Lincolns occasionally had a servant in their house. Most middle class families in Springfield, Illinois, in the 1830s and 1840s did have servants. And the Lincolns were not uh, different in that sense. They did not always have a servant. Mary Lincoln's management practices were not of the best. Her temper was rather severe, and it was hard to work for her. And people quit almost as quickly as they could be hired. But frequently there would be someone, perhaps a young Irish immigrant girl, perhaps a farmer's daughter from the countryside, or on occasion an African American young woman working in a Lincoln household. One of these, one of these worked for a neighboring family, the Bradfords. Her name was Ruth Burns Stanton, Ruth Burns at the time. And Ruth Burns, under an archaic and curious Illinois law, was not fully a free person. Slavery was abolished in Illinois by 1828, but it was not instantly abolished. Rather, a new status of apprentice was created for young people who would become fully free when they were 18. 
So Ruth Burns may have been one of these apprentices after the abolition of slavery in Illinois, who was not yet 18, and thus was, uh, as an apprentice, was essentially a neo-slave, forced to uh, work without wages for the family that, that employed her. And if it is true that the Bradfords occasionally lent uh, Ruth Burns to work at the Lincoln household on Sundays when Mary had driven off the most recent uh, hired help, then the Lincolns did not have slaves, but occasionally they may have used the services of somebody who was almost a slave. So the question is not, no pun intended, a black and white question. It is filled with shades of gray. Who is free? Who is not free? Who is less free than someone else? Uh, the question, did Lincoln own slaves, is a way of touching on where Lincoln fits in that spectrum. He is known as the great emancipator, the enemy of slavery, but was he really that? And that, finally, is what people are asking when they ask, did Lincoln own slaves? They're asking, should we regard Lincoln as the great emancipator, as the man who brought slavery to an end, or should we regard him as a hypocritical, dead white male who gets too much credit, uh, like all the white males in American history? Which way should we look at it? That is really what the question is asking. The answer to that is one that historians will debate, but I will offer you mine, which is that yes, Lincoln was indeed the great emancipator. He was not a hypocrite, despite the critics who attack Lincoln for not emancipating slaves more quickly or more fully during the Civil War. But those who criticize him do so, not necessarily out of an animus for Lincoln, but out of an animus for those who have elevated Lincoln to the status of purely the great emancipator, as if emancipation were his act alone. In fact, emancipation was the act of many people, Lincoln certainly, but also his cabinet who supported him, also the abolitionists who pushed him to act also the preachers, also the newspaper editors who argued in favor of abolition, also the families who sent uh, supported the war effort, and especially the soldiers at the front who enforced the proclamation at the point of their bayonets, and most especially the enslaved people themselves, who by running away created the contraband problem, who by agitating, uh, creating an issue of what their status would be when they left the plantation, forced the federal government to take an act. So Abraham Lincoln, who did oppose slavery his whole adult life, still you will hear is occasionally accused of not wanting to free the slaves, of doing so only reluctantly, only being forced into glory, as the Lord Bennett put it, as a political act. Um, when you, from, from there is a short uh, step to argue that uh, if he didn't want to free the slaves, well, maybe Lincoln owned slaves. And the question comes back out of the ground one more time. In fact, Lincoln, to repeat one more time, did not own slaves, did participate in the freeing of slaves, and if he did not echo in some ways the social and political views of 21st century America, that is simply because those have changed so radically since 19th century America. Let me close with a last discussion of the text most frequently quoted by those who would accuse Lincoln of not being the great emancipator, or who would argue uh, implicitly that if he did not own slaves, he was sympathetic to the institution. The text you'll hear most often quoted in this context comes from a speech, comes from the debates rather, that Lincoln engaged in against Stephen Douglas in 1858, particularly the debate at Ottawa, Illinois. In that debate, Lincoln said, and I quote, it is not my purpose to introduce social and political equality between the white and black races. And from there, uh, the quote goes on to some length to discuss what Lincoln means by political and social equality. People who quote this line rarely quote the previous three or four pages of Stephen Douglas, who engages in the most uh, vicious and, and vile race baiting, uses uh, language and not heard in modern political Course, uh, speaks very clearly of white supremacy and how the nation uh, of the United States is, is a white person, is a white man's nation, and how African Americans have no part in this government. It is in response to that, and Douglas's accusation that Lincoln uh, supported black equality, 
Then he made the statement just said, I do not intend to introduce social and political equality. Lincoln would have been foolish to have tried to introduce social and political equality because it is safe to say that almost no one in 19th century America believed there could be such a thing. No nation on earth had social and political equality between races as different as the European and African races. And it seemed unlikely that it would begin here. It is uh, perhaps to our shame that we have not fully proved Lincoln wrong that social and political equality has yet been completely achieved. But what Lincoln says at the end of his long discussion of what social and political equality actually mean uh, is to turn to Stephen Douglas sitting there on the stage with him and to say that uh, regardless of social and political rights, the real question here is human rights. And then he says, I agree with Judge Douglas that the black man is not my equal in many respects, certainly not in color, perhaps not in moral or intellectual endowment, but in the right to eat the bread without leave of anybody else which his own hand earns, he is my equal and the equal of Judge Douglas and the equal of every living man. Now, when Lincoln that day said he did not believe in political and social equality, a politician who said that today would justly be accused of racism. But Lincoln was speaking in 1858 to a crowd entirely white, entirely convinced of white supremacy. Uh, many in the crowd determined to vote for Stephen Douglas to preserve white supremacy. And Lincoln challenged them by saying that all people are equal in the right to earn the bread that their own hand earns. In that sense, it is an open question how much farther Lincoln would have gone if he had been able to see what would happen not just during the Civil War when African Americans fought for their country, but afterwards in the era of Reconstruction with Jim Crow and on into the Second Reconstruction in the Civil Rights Era. I started this talk by saying I would like to see Chief Justice Taney, the author of the Dred Scott decision, uh, with his look, no doubt, uh, stunned and confused to see the 21st century scene in the United States, a society in which race no longer bars Clarence Thomas from the Supreme Court or Barack Obama from the White House. As much as I would like to see that face, would it not be even better if we could somehow bring back to life for a moment Abraham Lincoln to see his face, not stunned and confused, but smile. Thank you very much. Phrase it, is there a Lincoln heir? The Lincoln fortune, uh, as it was, 
after this was litigated and determined that there was no uh, legal Lincoln heir, the Lincoln fortune reverted under the terms of, I think, Robert's will and went to several institutions. So there's no one who could stand to gain any money by being the, the heir of Abraham Lincoln. Um, so the answer is with so many Lincoln questions, it's very clear, no, there isn't. But yes, maybe there is. Let me ask one that might, might bring up something. True. Is it true, and, and especially in regards to if you could speak to his cabinet, did he actually say, I don't like that man, I'll have to get, him, get to know him better? Uh, I, I've not heard that actual quote, but it reflects closely what Lincoln said. The, the quote in question, I, I don't like that man, I'll have to get to know him better. Um, Lincoln was very, very good at diffusing uh, trouble, at avoiding problems by not having enemies. Uh, he did not, as one of his legal colleagues once said, Lincoln was not a good hater. Uh, he did not hate people. He did not carry grudges. Uh, his cabinet, as, as anybody who's read Doris Kearns Goodwin's uh, excellent book knows, consisted of people who were his strongest political rivals. Uh, he did say uh, that he wanted to put these people who were his political opponents in the cabinet where he could keep an eye on them. Uh, by having them close, uh, he could make sure they were causing trouble in the post of policies. So yes, that's a, an accurate way of looking at Lincoln's policies. Yes, sir? What did Lincoln think about John Brown? What did Lincoln think about John Brown? John Brown is, is, is an extraordinarily controversial character in American history. Is he the first great freedom fighter and uh, warrior against racism and slavery, or is he a domestic terrorist who would uh, cause the death of thousands uh, for no good purpose? People argue both sides. Lincoln personally denounced John Brown. He argued that, that uh, 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 Brown's act was, was foolish and uh, in trying to start a slave rebellion, that, that, that was not the policy of the Republican Party, that Lincoln was a uh, leading figure of at the time. Of course, the, the opponents of the Republicans, the Democrats at the time, were busy arguing that John Brown was indeed exactly the, the if not a member of the Republican Party, and the sort of thing that would happen if you follow the Republican anti-slavery doctrines, that's a logical extension of the uh, a violent revolution. So Lincoln argued against that and said uh, he did not support that. Lincoln was not an abolitionist. He never argued that slavery should be instantly abolished in the South. He felt there was no legal grounds for doing it and would not be practical. He was instead an anti-slavery man who argued that slavery should not be allowed to spread into the Western territories because then it would eventually die a natural death if confined to the South. So Brown's act of trying to kill it where it lay in the South was outside of what Lincoln supported. Yes, sir? I guess maybe part of the root of the question about you know, where, Nick, where Lincoln's core was relative to slavery might be driven by an interest of uh, of people today or people throughout history to say, you know, where were where was this man's faults? I mean, he's so mythologized. Uh, you know, it's it's natural for people to say, you know, it, nobody can be that perfect. And and I think the discussion about is he overly mythologized is an interesting one. I guess to frame that in a question, where do you think he is particularly overly mythologized, or where do you think his faults or failures were? I, I think it's a wonderful question. Where where are Lincoln's faults? I will. Uh, Lincoln told the story of the man who gets on a stagecoach and riding along, and another guy in the stagecoach uh, pulls out a flask and offers him a drink of whiskey, and the man says, "No, I, I don't drink." And the, a few miles later, the the first rider pulls out a plug of tobacco and offers the, the man some tobacco. He says, "No, I don't chew." Um, and the, the, a few miles later, he pulls out a deck of cards and says, you want to play cards? No, I don't gamble. Um, and finally, they come to the end of the ride, and the, the guy who doesn't do anything gets off, and the other one says, I, I just want you to know it's been my uh, experience in life that those with few vices have damn few virtues. Uh, <laughs> Lincoln told that story as a way of making fun of himself. He didn't drink or chew tobacco or play cards. Uh, he, he didn't have a lot of traditional vices, but somehow he had the knack of not making other people feel bad about it. He did serve alcohol at White House parties, for example. He didn't make everyone else do what he did. Uh, he didn't object to generals or 
drug to chew tobacco as long as it was in balance. Uh, he could be moral but not being moralistic. And that is a remarkable trait. It's very hard to teach others or to encourage others to do something without sounding holier than thou. And Lincoln was free of that. He, he, had, he had very little ego in one sense. Now that actually goes the opposite direction of your question. Where is it fault? Here's another virtue. If it was a fault, you could say he had overwhelming ambition. He was determined to do something with his life that would be remembered for all time. And his ambition certainly led him to do such things. But the ambition, he qualified uh, in a little, he wrote a little piece of paper that still survives in the Library of Congress, it's just a scrap, it's not written to anyone. Uh, he's just making notes in the mid-1850s about Stephen Douglas, his rival. Douglas has become the most famous politician on earth and nobody's heard of me. I'm a flat failure. Uh, he says, I would rather, I wish I, I had the, the adulation that Douglas has. But then he says, but I would only want it if I could get it by doing something good for my fellow man. If I had to get it by stepping on the backs of others, implying that that's how Douglas did it, by stepping on the backs of the slaves, um, I, I would have no use for it. So Lincoln had a, a huge ambition, but again, not one un, unbounded. I guess the last thing I'll say about your question is, I, in, in my career as a historian, every time I start studying any historical figure, general from the Civil War, or someone on the home front, sooner or later I get to the part where I go, oh, he's interesting, but yeah, he's, he, he messes up all the time. He's got these flaws. He has these personality quirks. I wouldn't want to have a uh, stagecoach drive with that guy, or I wouldn't want my daughter to date that guy. Um, I never got to that point with Lincoln, and I spent 20 years. I have not got to the point where I say, oh, that's, there's the feet of play. That's what's really wrong with him. Maybe I'm not a good historian, but I, I, I'm not trying to mythologize him. He seems to be a remarkably cool person. Yes, ma'am. Sure. Turning back to the question of Darwin was born at about the same time as Lincoln, did they ever meet and did Darwin have any influence on Lincoln? Uh, excellent question. They, they share the same birthday. Charles Darwin and Abraham Lincoln both born February 12, 1809. Uh, no, they never met. Um, Lincoln certainly would have known of Darwin's work. Every educated person knew that uh, uh, about the origin of species uh, having been published in the 1850s. But no, there's no evidence that there's any influence. There's a there's an interesting book uh, you can get a biography of not a biography but a, a book of, uh, called Parallel Lives about Abraham Lincoln and Walt Whitman uh, that traces the two of them who were both in Washington during the war. It's not a bad book, but it shows what people will do to write a book about Lincoln. Every day Lincoln would go between uh, the, the summer home and the summer where he stayed at the White House commuting to work. He would see Whitman on the sidewalk and they would nod at each other. That's their connection. 200 page book. And that's all they had in common. It's called Parallel Lives. Parallel lines don't meet. It's two separate people. They have almost nothing. But if you get Lincoln in the title, you sell many more copies than if you don't. The uh, Bennett Surf once said the ideal title for a book would be Lincoln's Doctor's Dog. Because people like to read about dogs and doctors. Um, so, no Darwin, no Lincoln, no connection. Yes, sir. Would you comment on Lincoln as commander in chief? Uh, did he do a good job? And did he really say, uh, thank God for Michigan? <laughs> yes, yes, he did. Um, I'll start with the latter. Uh, he, did. he thanked other states too at different times, but uh, yes, he, he was. Uh, very appreciative early in the war when the first drafts of the first regiment started showing up in Washington to defend the Capitol. Um, as commander in chief, uh, we can start at the bottom line. Lincoln won, uh, so that, that's uh, a point in his favor. Like so many other things in Lincoln's life, it's a remarkable story of growth. Uh, just as his views on uh, what should be done with the former slaves changed over time, his views on the military changed over time. At first, he tried to Learn about uh, military affairs. He borrowed a book from the, life, from the, the Library of Congress and studied it. Uh, he tried to get other generals to be his advisors. And after a while, uh, for a while, he tried to run the war himself using the telegraph and the, the War Department office and was literally sending orders to individual regiments to do this or that. That didn't work. At some point, in 1862, he realized that grand strategy is really pretty simple, it's a lot of common sense. Uh, just don't uh, it, it, attack the enemy from two places at once if you can. If you have twice as many men, use them all at once, don't use half an hour and a half later. 
how the enemy can fight them both separately. Um, attack the enemy's army. If you destroy Lee's army, you don't need to capture Richmond. You can walk in there unguarded. Uh, the cities aren't the point of the war. It's defeating the enemy army. Uh, Lincoln recognized all these things before some of his generals did. Uh, so he was intuitively, uh, he became an excellent uh, strategist. And he was hands-off enough by the end of the war to let Grant and Sherman do what they needed to do. Um, so he became, over time, a, a very successful commander in chief. I have another question. Um, it seemed like he had a premonition the day before he was killed, but he, there was another assassination attempt where a bullet went through his hat, and that he would ride alone all over the place and actually went and watched the battle, snuck into Richmond during the war. I mean, it was just it was amazing. <laughs> things that he did to tempt faithful. He did. Those were all accurate. Lincoln, Lincoln risked his life on a number of occasions. Um, he, he, uh, he, he would ride, as I mentioned, to the summer home by himself. Uh, eventually a cavalry bodyguard was assigned to him. But sometimes he would just forget and just leave and ride a few miles outside of Washington by himself. And one night when he arrived there, there was a bullet through his hat. Somebody had taken a shot at him. Um, uh, somebody loosened the uh, bolts on the seat to the, uh, the driver's seat on the carriage that Lincoln's rode in. Uh, Lincoln wasn't riding the day that it came off, but Mary was. Uh, it came off, the horses panicked and bolted, Mary fell out of the moving carriage and, and hit her head and was nearly killed. Um, there were other assassination attempts. The reason Lincoln did this, I think, uh, has to do with uh, the ideal of manhood in the 19th century. There were, by, by the mid-19th century, very clear separate codes of behavior for men and women. And one of the codes of behavior, and, and too much of the court history for, for men, was to be courageous and uh, uh, willing to sacrifice their lives in, in the cause. When Lincoln was elected, he went to Washington for his inauguration in 1861 on a train. And he got a warning from Pinkerton, the, uh, the, the not the security guard, but the uh, detective. Who, Firm today, the Arnold's Malls across America. Um, Pinkerton warned him that he was going to be assassinated when, his, when he changed trains in Baltimore. And he thought, well, you know, I, I, bad way to start the administration. I won't let that happen. So he went through Baltimore in disguise. Didn't wear his, his trademark tall hat. He wore a cloak that covered his whole uh, frame and, and went through by himself. Uh, so no entourage. So he showed up in Washington uh, with. At five in the morning, in a train platform all alone, nobody there to meet him. Uh, that's how the president entered the Capitol. The newspapers had a field day with this. They drew cartoons of him sneaking in. They wrote captions like a thief in the night. They showed him uh, in all kinds of disguises. Eventually, uh, drew pictures of him wearing women's clothes, sneaking in, uh, attacking the very idea of his manhood, that he was a coward, that he was afraid for his life. Lincoln, from the time he saw those pictures, never took another step to protect himself. Avoided having the guards follow him to the summer home, went across the White House lawn to the telegraph office at night unprotected, uh, eventually goes to the theater unprotected. Uh, he, he swore after that one experience where he was mocked for taking precautions that he would never again take the precaution to protect his own life. And no matter what people around him tried to do, they were unsuccessful. And of course, the result is what happened in the Ford's theater. Questions from the uh, the young people who desire extra credit here. Um, <laughs> just someone with real extra credit. Can they ask the question? No, too old. Sorry. No. Yes, sir. Uh, with the death of Lincoln's son, how much would you say that affects his administration? Because I've heard he was depressed throughout his life, and that's big, it had a big impact on him. Yeah. The, an excellent question. The question is, what about the death of Lincoln's son? Willie died in February 1862 during the war. And as, as, as you say, Lincoln had suffered from depression at various times earlier in his life. Uh, in 1836, after a young woman that he knew and perhaps was involved with after she died. Then 1841, after his best friend moved away and his engagement with Mary Todd broke up, another fit of depression. Willie was, was the, the apple of the eye of the Lincolns. He was just the brightest boy. He wrote poems. Uh, he was uh, smart. He was, um, Tabitha was he's, he's cute, but, but not, not the brightest uh, uh, kids. Uh, Willie was, was just the special one. And his death uh, was devastating to Mary Lincoln. And indeed, she never really recovered her mental 
downs uh, after that. As for Lincoln himself, uh, for a while, every Thursday, he died, Willie died on a Thursday, every Thursday he would go into the room uh, where Willie had died and close off for the day and spend the day in the morning. Uh, but somehow, he was able to, to master that grief. And, and speaking as a parent, I can't imagine it. But somehow, he was able to compartmentalize, to separate the personal grief over Willie perhaps use it to attach himself to the cause for which the, the American, the, 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 the Union was fighting. Uh, 600,000 other young men died, and their parents grieved. So in a sense, he may have felt the sacrifice he made, uh, not on the battlefield, but on the, the sickbed, uh, was part of, of what the whole country was going through. And he had no right to be especially grieved. He couldn't quit being president, because he was asking the rest of the country to keep fighting, not quit, even though they're something. But how he managed it, uh, was, again, his unimaginable strength. Uh, certainly it affected him, but somehow he managed to close it off and carry on. Yes? I'm going to first note, um, uh, why did he choose to have a beard? Why did Lincoln choose to have a beard? Some of you may already know the story. I'll tell it very shortly. Um, he was, uh, it was a recommend recommendation to him by a 12-year-old girl in Westfield, New York who wrote him a letter uh, saying, do you have any daughters that I can correspond with? By the way, uh, your face is so thin, uh, you would look much better with whiskers and all the ladies would tease our husbands to vote for you. Uh, and he wrote back uh, saying, uh, I can't, uh, I don't have any sons. As for uh, uh, wearing whiskers, would it not be a silly affectation for me to start at this time in life? I'm paraphrasing that, that's roughly it. And yet, when this train pulled into Westfield on the way to uh, Washington, he had started growing the beard. That letter, um, and Grace Bedell, who was the, the, the girl who wrote the letter, and the letter is in the Detroit Public Library uh, in the Burke Historical Collection. And there is, like every beautiful, touching story of children and so on, there's an ugly end to it. Um, there's litigation where some descendants of the Bedell family are trying to get the letter back, uh, claiming it was stolen from, from that, which I don't think is the case. Now, I'm, I'm drawing a brief blank whether it's the Vidal letter or Lincoln's reply that's in the, the Georgia collection. It's one or the other. I could look it up. I know it's in this book. I could look it up. So I need to read about it. Uh, but one of the letters is there, either, either the reply or, the, or, or her letter. I believe it's his reply, actually, that's there. Um, so we have that here uh, uh, in the New York column here. Uh, and hopefully it will stay there. Yes, ma'am. Um, how long was he passed that before he was assassinated? He was elected in 1860, became president in 1861, re-elected in 64. So he was inaugurated uh, in March of 1865 and assassinated the following month in April of 1865. Made one term and then, uh, and then one. Yes? mother and, and uh, then the introduction of his stepmother affect uh, his life. Well, one thing to, to keep in mind with a question like that is the 19th century is different from the 21st century. It was a rare family that didn't have a death. Um, in, in a parent, a child, uh, a relative. Uh, people didn't grow old together. Conditions were just different. They didn't understand uh, uh, germs, uh, the diseases were much more likely to be fatal. Uh, Mary, uh, uh, Nancy Lincoln died. Uh, his father immediately married uh, Sarah Bush Johnston Lincoln. And she and Abraham were very, very close. And he loved his stepmother very much. There's a lot of debate. Lincoln once said, all I am or hope to be, I owe to my angel mother. Now, was he talking about Nancy or was he talking about Sarah? Um, I would argue it's Nancy because that's the angel mother, the one in heaven, not the living mother. And that's another reference to uh, paternity, to the, 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 that virgin aristocrat's DNA through his angel mother that made him uh, what he thought he was. Yes, sir? If Lincoln was not assassinated, how was the Reconstruction the different same under our Johnson administration? That, what would have happened if Lincoln not been assassinated? 
That is a, a wonderful question, and it is, in fact, uh, the next book I'm working on. Um, I won't give you the whole book. Uh, I'll, I'll give you one fact from it uh, that make, makes me feel Obviously, it'd be different. It'd be radically different. Traditionally, uh, in the very old days, when I was at North, for example, we had old textbooks, um, you would sometimes see the argument dating back to the turn of the 19th century that Johnson was a mild-mannered uh, uh, person who was kind to the South, just like Lincoln would have been. But those evil radical Republicans turned on him, and we had bad reconstruction. Um, in fact, uh, historians have rejected that view for the last 50 years, and hopefully your textbooks have caught up with that by now. Um, Johnson, uh, to give one single fact, Johnson was a Democrat. Lincoln was a Republican. Lincoln would have wanted there to be a two-party system in the South with his party participating. Johnson did not care if there was a Republican party in the South. So Johnson did nothing to protect the votes of Republicans, which were primarily the former slaves, uh, or some uh, Northerners who went South, or some Southerners who saw the future of the country as a biracial future. Johnson was happy to sit by and watch the traditional elite white power structure reassert itself, crush black voting, crush Republican power, and turn the South into a one-party state for the next 50 years, or 70 years, really, until after World War II. Lincoln wouldn't have put up with that, not necessarily out of the goodness of his heart or his racial views, but simply because he was a Republican. He wouldn't have tolerated that kind of uh, one-sided politics. So we would have had a very different world. We would not have had a solid South. Um, I'll be working on that in the book, but it's a great question. I think it's one that really gets to a lot of how we got to where we are today. We have time for two more questions. I think one of them over there, please. Uh, the question about the grave robbery. Um, there's a wonderful new book called Stealing Lincoln's Body by Thomas uh, Crowell. I highly recommend it. In 1876, I think, 77, I think it was 76, um, some grave robbers in Illinois, some dim-witted grave robbers, decided they would steal the body of Abraham Lincoln and hold it for ransom uh, to get some of their fellow uh, criminals out of jail. It didn't work. They, they, you, you've got to read the book. Uh, not my book, I'll, I'll push for Thomas uh, Crowell's book, very funny book. Um, after that, the, the, after that whole fiasco, the body was very, it, they brought it up again around 1901 uh, to take another look to make sure that it really was Lincoln in there, which it was. Um, and I think it was the last time after that, uh, but I, I don't remember for sure. Yeah, they're, 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 it's stranger than fiction, the, the whole story about the, the, the people, the, the, the secret group that guards Lincoln's body, um, that where the tomb is, how it got there. Uh, it, it's a wonderful story, and I, I, I recommend it to the band. Thank you. I'll take one last question. You mentioned that Lincoln was born in Kentucky, which was a slave state. Did his parents own slaves? An excellent question. Lincoln was born in Kentucky, uh, a slave state. What about his parents? Did they own slaves? Uh, the answer is no. Thomas Lincoln was his father. And uh, the Lincolns uh, belonged to uh, a uh, what's called a hard shell Baptist church, which was anti-slavery. And Thomas Lincoln did not own slaves. It was anti-slavery. It's worth noting, in the 19th century, many people were anti-slavery without being uh, what we would call politically enlightened today. You could be anti-black and anti-slavery. Many white Americans opposed slavery because they didn't want the economic competition of slaves, because they didn't like African Americans in what they perceived as white America, whether they were free or slave. So to say someone is anti-slavery is not to say necessarily that they were a modern, a progressive type of person. Thomas Lincoln opposed slavery for whatever reasons, and his family never owned slaves. Lincoln then, however, married Mary Todd, whose family was also from Kentucky, and they did own slaves. And the Todds were uh, wealthy and, and owned a number of slaves. And uh, again, slavery touches Lincoln throughout his whole life, whether he wants it to or not, uh, in that kind of proximity. 
There's one more earnest hand in the back. So I'm just <laughs> Yes, yes. Uh, the question, what, what was in Lincoln's wallet uh, when he was assassinated? There's a, it's in the Library of Congress today, there's a small box containing uh, the, the contents of his pockets on the day he was assassinated. And in his wallet were things like a newspaper clipping, uh, a Confederate bill, uh, a picture of uh, John Bright, I believe, the English abolitionist, uh, and a few other odds and ends. But it certainly gives a, a personal touch to the, uh, the the Lincoln, the Marble Lincoln you see in Washington, the, the person who's idealized and perhaps over memorialized, uh, to see the humble things that he, he carried with him on, on his last night. Well, thank you so much for your attention tonight. Uh,